So hi everyone. Uh, my name is Matan, and I am pretty excited to tell you about the Dowstack project. I'll let some people um, take their seats. So in the meanwhile, let me just tell you that this is a result of, of four years of research and development, and finally, I think we are ready to uh, give birth to, the, to that product. So the name obviously gives the way, right? It's an operational stack for DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, but more, more generally, more broadly, it's an operating system for collective intelligence. Okay, so let me give you some background um, about the problem, like why, why we're doing that. So the firm or the company or the organization um, is orientable but subscalable, and let me define that. So basically the firm is an economical tool. It's a setup to align the interests of many agents, many actors, around a shared goal, a shared, shared mission. So that's what I mean by orientables. Like once you have that set up, you can orient, you can drive that force toward any different goal or mission. So it's orientable. However, it's subscalable, which means that when you grow the organization, when you grow the structure, it becomes less and less effective, less, less effective per person. So in that, say, in that sense, it's scalable sublinearly. So I call it subscalable. Now, the free market is another way to coordinate large number of people. And by the way, every, for the rest of my talk, I will only consider large number of people. So when I say organization, I mean large organizations. So all organizations on the planet are becoming less and less effective. All large organizations on the planet become less and less effective when they grow. But however, free markets are just the opposite. They are super scalable. Free market networks they become more effective as they grow. But on the other hand, free market is not non-orientable. So you cannot drive the free market to accomplish certain mission. Um, it just grows, right? So with these two definitions, I will define now the DAO. So I know that right now in the space, DAO is, is used very liberally and in a very wide area of uh, um, instances. So I will, I will have my little definition of DAO. So I will define the DAO to be this new form of human association which is both orientable, it can be driven toward to achieve certain missions, but it's also super scalable. It's actually the first organization that becomes more effective when it grows rather than less so. Now the outcome of, of being super scalable is that it hits an exponential growth uh, trajectory. So you know it's effective, so it grows, but then it's more effective, so it grows faster, and it's more effective, it grows faster, and so on and so forth. So it's, it hits an exponential growth uh, trajectory, trajectory and basically eats up the entire container until it reaches the boundaries and then it saturates so that's the famous S curve that any network effect you know structure uh, goes. So DAO stack enables global networks to self-organize around shared goals and joint action combining the scale and efficiency of the largest markets with the alignment and coherence of the smallest firms. So this is the, this is the goal. So let me give you briefly, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with that, but briefly some use cases. So basically, any, any sort of applic decentralized application or decentralized autonomous organization that I ever uh, witnessed can fall under this categorization. It's either a, basically an instance of collaboration, so it can be thousands of open source developers, maybe millions of open, so open source developers cooperating around shared missions, maybe Wikipedia, editors, and so on and so forth, so collaboration. Asset management means that uh, the decision in that organization is about a funneling of asset. It can be um, a port portfolio network, it can be uh, a pension fund or a decentralized insurance network. Curation, of course, uh, well, we're all familiar with, with curation. Google is a curation engine for websites, um, TripAdvisors, Booking, and Yelp. The problem with today's crowd curation is that the most important v value contributor to the, to the business cycle, which is the curators, is kept outside the b business cycle. And that's why the, the, I would say the capacity, the curation capacity is very low relatively. So this is a, a new stage of curation where you have gigantic networks of curators that are cooperating to create objects, but are also com being compensated back with the value that they're they creating. 
And fourthly, the marketplace uh, example, which is a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. It can be uh, e-commerce, but it can also be um, ride-sharing. Now, the marketplace is actually the only, ex only category that doesn't require a collective decision-making engine, although it can be en enhanced with one. So, of course, DAO stack is, is powered by Ethereum, and basically it's ready to go on the mainnet uh, this month. So I'll show you a demo of the first application on the stack um, that is now deployed on the Kova network, and, and we'll have it on the mainnet in the next few weeks. So it's a kind of, sort of like pre-MVP stage. So the DAO scape, the landscape of DAOs. So what, what does it mean? As I said, like every exponential organization, if, when it hits the exponential trajectory, it just grows to infinity. But then a lot of other uh, instances, instantiations of that are occurring, either or, or com on, with competi competition on different value systems on the same domain or other domains. So that basically creates an explosion, yet another company explosion of DAOs, and then you create an ecosystem, and there will be a strong emphasis about the interoperability of those DAOs in that ecosystem. So a word about complex system. Um, there is no way to build a complex system. There is no such thing. Um, so there is no way to build a DAO ecosystem or a DAO no more than there, there is a way to build a complex system. What you can do is that you can design a complex system by designing, building its elements, then engineering its dynamics, setting up for evolution, and then giving a good initial condition. So that's, if you, if you made a job that three points right, you create an ecosystem, or a complex, generally complex system. So if we take that into the DAO scape, we need the elements, so basically the DAO scape letters, the building blocks, the Lego blocks for building DAOs and building ecosystem of DAOs, then setting up for evolution, for dynamics between elements, and dynamics between DAOs, so interoperability of DAOs. And finally, initial condition. So we wanted to achieve super scalable organizations that will require super scalable governance systems. So governance systems that can process more and more decisions per number of people as they grow the number of people, which is just the opposite from any decision-making engine, engine that ever was invented. So super scalable governance system will be required to be the initial conditions. So let's start with the DAO stack letters. So ARC is a modular, adaptive, and upgradable governance framework on top of the Ethereum blockchain. And that's basically the DAO stack, DAO stack a DAO scape letters. So this is the atomic unit of governance. We call it smart agency, which is basically a bunch of agents, of actors, interacting under smart contracts, or actually a quite, quite large bundle of smart contracts, but under a set of rules. And this is how we think about DAOs. So it's sort of like mesh networks of smart agencies. And, and, and this is just a caricature, caricature, but probably way beyond that, much more complex. So let me tell you a little bit about the ARC framework and the smart agency that you can create with them. So this, again, this is the atomic unit of governance. Basically, every element that you're seeing in the, in the image is a smart contract. So every, every governance system can be, can be divided into the do's and don'ts, right? So the do's is basically if you know, people say such and such, then the collective will do such and such. And the don'ts is no matter what happens, no matter what people say, we'll never do such and such, okay? So the do's, for example, uh, it's like, let's say, give you an example, if 50% of reputation holders vote to approve a transaction uh, of tokens, then the transaction is being executed. Also, by the way, token sale is also uh, goes under this category. If Ether comes into this address, then print token and send it back, right? And the don'ts can be, for example, no matter what happens, this governance unit will not print over 1 million tokens, or no, no matter what happens, this governance unit will not spend more than 1,000 Ether a month. And note that the global we call that global constraint, the previous one, by the way, we, we call governance schemes, and note that the global constraints also contain the condition to change the global constraints. So, for example, I can be a global constraint saying, no matter what happens, this, this governance unit will not, pre, will not spend over 1,000 ether a month, and only governance, six, only governance scheme number eight can change me. And maybe governance scheme number eight requires 80% of reputation holders for approval. Okay? So, you see, in this way, 
every possible governance system can be coded into this framework, but more so, also the rules to change the rules are part of the rules. And then the actors. So the two top contracts is the token distributor and reputation or voting power or influence uh, distributor. So they are the internal actors, right? They are distribu distributing the internal tokens and reputation of this agency. And then there is the avatar, which is the external, external actor. So basically it's the face of that unit in the world. That avatar can do basically anything that can be done on the blockchain. It can vote as a single agent. So the whole unit, the whole agency can vote as a single agent inside another, another agency. It can send transactions, funds, and well, basically can call any function under any contract on the blockchain. So it's the face of the, of the, of the agency. Finally, the controller, which controls the actor and dominated by the, you know, by the governance schemes uh, confined to the global constraints. Um, note that there is like three dots at the bottom, which are three special functions that the con controller can also uh, trigger. One of them is changing the list of governance sch schemes that are subscribed, that are basically allow allowed to interact with the controller. So basically registering new governance scheme or unregistering uh, an old one. And the, the second, the same, the same for global constraints. And finally, the third one is transferring the ownership of the, con so the controller is the sole owner of the, of the actors. And the third one is basically transferring that uh, ownership to a new contract, potentially a new controller, which basically means that this function is upgrading the entire system. So the whole thing, both the protocol level and the technology is fully upgradable. Um, and finally, universality uh, means that each of the white contract that you see over there is basically universal in the sense that you, not, you, don't, you don't need to redeploy it every time you're deploying a new uh, agency. So the only thing you need to redeploy is the tokens, reputations, and avatars. So in that sense, this, uh, these modules are, are serving as a governance as a service sort of thing. So maybe just before going on, just let me, let me emphasize that the ARC, ARC contains the architecture for this, like the, this framework, but also contains the library, the like open library of modules with which anyone can fix their own organization. So in that sense, it's kind of like WordPress for organizations, just as in WordPress you can you know, pick different modules and plugins and make your own website. Here you can pick different modules and plugins and make your own organization. And, if, and then if you're, if you're missing some protocol, you can just build a new module, and then everyone can join even a larger uh, library. So the second point was about interoperability of DAOs, and for that, uh, we have enhanced uh, ARC towards the, the full DAO stack. So this is the DAO stack. So at the bottom, of course, uh, this, there is the Solidity framework, which you call ARC, and then there are shared registries um, that are supporting interoperability of decentralized applications of various interfaces, uh, which we call archives. It can be the registry that maps. Uh, by the way, these are curated registries, so they can they can basically curate, for example, uh, the entire set of uh, modules, governance modules, or they can curate uh, the entire set of agencies that were created with the platform. Or it can also be just a registry uh, for in, for like interoperability, interdap uh, messaging, for example or interdap requests. So different interface can, uh, can interact with each other uh, universally and by that creating a larger network effect. So these are the Arc hives. And then the ArcJS is, is basically an, an, an API layer. It's a, it's a library uh, over Web3, which, which kind of like bridges Solidity um, to JavaScript, but also make it higher level so that like it make it very easy for front end developers to develop and integrate their collaborative apps to the stack without understanding anything about the blockchain, but also without understanding the architect even the architecture of Arc. Like you don't need to call different contracts in different order. You can just, with high level command, you can create and configure organization. You can participate, vote, make proposals, and anything can, that can be done on the Arc framework. And the result of that is, is, is you know, a, a variety of applications that can integrate and interoperate with each other, the dApps, and we've developed one of them that, that I'll show you in a moment, which we call Alchemy, with which you can now open more and more smart agencies and then cloud or mesh networks of those agencies with shared tokens economy, um, basically form DAOs. And of course, then there would be the question, but how do we make them super scalable, right? 
So we'll answer that in a moment, but before that, let me just show you a quick, really quick demo of Alchemy. So this is the last version um, deployed on the Kova network. Let's see if the internet per permits us. If not, I have like, uh, well, I have a video of a slightly older version. Let's see. So the feature to open right now a DAO is disabled. So we just see the DAOs that exist there. Um, so let's enter here. This is the Genesis DAO. This is actually, the Genesis DAO will be the first DAO that is, will be deployed this month uh, over Alchemy, which will be actually the DAO that is supporting the DAOSTAR project with its gen token. So you can see there are like a propo open proposal over here. So there are the proposal over here, downstairs. Let me see if it works, yeah. So that are, these are the regular proposals. So they require majority of reputation holders in order to be executed. Ah, sorry. Thanks. Yeah, much better. Yeah, so the, the, the proposals downstairs are the proposals that need absolute majority in order to be executed. And then you can, for example, you can vote. Let's vote on this proposal over here. Build a plantoid at Burning Man. So now we're submitting it. Paying gas for it. So we're just not up, upvoting it. So the special thing in, of this protocol, and I'll, me, I'll just mention it in a moment, and then I'll have uh, my second talk tomorrow that I will expand about it, but that's, but that's what makes uh, decentralized governance work at scale, is that you can also, there is an, an additional layer on top of the governance layer, which is a prediction layer. So you can also predict anyone, actually not from within the DAO, anyone can come and predict whether a certain proposal will pass or fail. So let's give a prediction over here um, that the proposal will pass. And let's pay the gas for it. So once enough um, predictions are predicting that a, propos a certain proposal is going to pass, I think there is another transaction here, then, um, th then that, that proposal is being be be basically being boosted, which means that it's open for finite time, shorter finite time, and then at the end of that time period, uh, the decision is being executed irrespectively if there is, a, irrespective of quorum, basically. So if the majority of the voters, not all the reputation holders, if the majority of voters say yes, it's being executed, if they say no, it's being failed. And that's like the, the, the critical part of the holographic consensus, which I will expand about tomorrow. Um, yeah, so we, uh, let me not get into too much details here, but you can also create a proposal, of course, and all that. So let's, with that, let me... Go back over here. So the, f the, the last piece of this talk is uh, basically mentioning holographic consensus. It's just a teaser for tomorrow. And again, the idea here is how do you make uh, well super scalable governance system? So governance system that can process more and more decisions per person when it grows up. So firstly, and again, these are like the, the two last slides of this talk is kind of like the two first slides of the next talk, not exactly, um, but just, just to have something in mind. So what's the problem? Why it's so hard? Why, why it was never done yet? The problem is that there is a core tension in any decentralized system. There is a core tension between resilience and scale. So if I need to sum it up in one sentence, if you're demanding, if you're acquiring for too much of the collective attention for each and every proposals, then clearly you are not uh, scalable or definitely not, uh, not, definitely not uh, super scalable. And secondly, if you are demanding for too little collective attention for each and every proposal, you are potentially not resilient to faulty behavior. And potentially even both. You can be at the same time not resilient and not scalable. So the way to um, go about this, uh, to basically to, wait to solve this tension, is, and we call that holographic consensus, is by allowing small groups of people, so that's, that's what we're doing with, with the relative majority and the boosting period, allowing small group of people make the, making decisions on behalf of the larger majority, but in a way that is crypto-economically ensured to be in alignment. Basically what, we're, basically what we are doing is that if, if there is a mismatch between the status quo of a proposal and what people believe is the truth of the DAO, you know, the outcome that the DAO would vote on if everyone would look at it, 
then there is, a, there is a potential profit to be made by signaling that mismatch. And that signaling uh, layer is being done with basically the staking layer that I mentioned before, uh, st staking against or for a proposal, uh, and that's, that's what we've been, we, we, th that is done with the gen tokens of the project. Yeah, so with that, uh, you know, any questions? Uh, thank you. The mechanisms for ensuring that people uh, are not doing bad things to the majority. Sure. I mean, I will get into much more detail tomorrow if you come at 12. So yeah. I'll give half an hour just about the, the full protocol and the logic behind it. But again, basically, the idea is that only if enough people are predicting that a proposal is going to pass, only then it's being boosted. And you can ensure by that is that there is... So basically, you, 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 can, you are crypto-economically monetizing the possible mismatches. So you can make profit by signaling a mismatch. But again, I'll, I'll give much more, much more details about it tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs> Not to completely ruin the talk. Yeah, that's like the, that's a recurring question. Um, so yeah, so I don't think we are any, anywhere different from Argon in our vision. Um, also, Colony, Jack is over there. Um, and, I, and then there is Harbor, and there are now, I think, big, big number, of, well, a growing number of players that are having the same, sharing the same vision, and also we are we're in full interaction with each other. Um, I think the differences are eventually in the details. Like, eventually, you'll, you'll just get different architectures, completely different architectures. So, for example, our unique element is the, um, you know, from the beginning, we had a very ecosystemic approach. So we haven't built like an application and then build a protocol and then build a platform. We, we, we started from a platform, like a fully general platform. And when we finished that, we built a protocol. And then we finished that, we built application. So it's, I think we went just the other direction from all other projects. And we'll see the result if it's better or not. But it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't really matter. We're not like, it's not, for me, it's not a competition. We are, do, I think, you know, we have our own uh, design, which is more bottom up, I would say, more eco ecosystemic. Um, the second, I think, big differentiator is the holographic consensus. So again, as far as I, I mean, as I said in the beginning, I think DAOs are being used liberally. But the, what I call DAO is this super scalable organization. And I think that's the first protocol that actually achieves that, uh, it, potentially. So that, I think these are the two differentiators. Maybe another, you know, a third one is that, again, as I, I, gave it, I, saw, I showed the, um, the image over there. Again, a lot of DAOs that are being uh, mentioned are more looking at something like that of the form of this, where mm -hmm. the DAO, I mean, and, and we've designed the, the architecture in order to facilitate these kind of DAOs. So it's, maybe it's another third differentiator. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you, Dan. Oh, one more question, sorry. Yeah. Just, I'd just love to hear you uh, share some of your daydreams about where this stuff might go. You know, if we kind of cast your mind 50 years forward, um, what does the world look like? I know it's all crazy and it's a complex system and things like that, but if you're, if you're entertaining the ideas here uh, that, that could challenge the nation state, I'm just curious how you think about it. Sure. Um, so I don't think we need to go f that far, by the way. I think 5, 10, 15 years is, is down the road is, is totally um, phase changing. So basically, I think you can, you can see how these things evolved in history for different cases. So when, whenever you create a, 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 you know, a much more efficient, like multiplicative economy rather than uh, additive economy or exponential economy rather than multiplicative economy uh, or super scalable structure rather than subscalable structure. So the internet, for example, is an example, right? So basically once you created that structure, the whole domain of, the, of this information distribution completely shifted, right? It ate the, the entire domain uh, and swallowed all legacy organizations that, that exist before. I think that the same thing will happen here for the domain of cooperation. 
So any coordination, any work, but also, as I said, like decentralized insurance. Like once, it's a phase transition. It's not, a, I mean, of course it's a process, but a phase transition is a process that, find, that suddenly accelerates exponentially fast. And that's what we create here. Once the MVP of a DAO will be created, it will, exponent, it, it, it will run exponentially fast. Initially, it exponent looks linearly, but there is, after some point, there is like this knee and then it goes, and that's what will happen. And, and the, the outcome of that is that the entire domain of cooperation, of work, of structures, of society, basically, will shift into a co completely uh, a, a new, fo new form. So, so just as today we are you know, dominated by corporations and governments, I think this is completely going to shift to domination by networks, by decentralized networks that actually run the entire economy from bottom to top. So how that looks like, we can, we can, we can spend like a, a, an hour about that. So, yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, you, you should have asked the same question about blockchain, right? Do you think that the elite will allow this transition? And no, they don't. That's true, and that's what's, that's what's right, happening these days. Yeah. Okay, we're running out of time, so we'll do that conversation later. Thank you very much.